Thanks for joining us on The Briefing. I'm Lauren Stevenson, live in Chicago. Let's begin with the coronavirus. As cases continue to rise quickly across the U.S., the need for a vaccine is becoming more urgent. The U.S. reported more than 2,000 deaths Thursday, the most since May. It revoked the emergency authorization for hydroxychloroquine. So if the FDA approves a vaccine, can we trust it at this point? I've heard a lot of people say, you know, we can't trust polling given Hillary Clinton's loss in 2016. So if you're comparing the final polling of the 2016 cycle with today's final polling, is Joe Biden in the same position or are there differences in their standing? And notably, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo ordering, as I mentioned earlier, restaurants and bars to close at 10 p.m. beginning tomorrow, but they'll remain open uh, during the day for indoor service. Dr. William Schaffner, always great to see you. Thank you so much. Some Brits are biting their nails over the U.S. presidential election, but not for purely political reasons. The record number of people betting on the 2020 race. We're following breaking news this hour out of Georgia. The Secretary of State just announced that all votes in the presidential election will be recounted by hand. He spent months conducting search, rescue and recovery operations at Ground Zero. Now he's living with seven illnesses caused by his work there. The illnesses exacerbated his battle with COVID-19 earlier this year. He nearly died from it. His doctor has not given us his viral load. We don't have the details of his last negative test, as I previously mentioned. So what's the likelihood that he is still contagious? That's not to say that there isn't ever voter fraud. I mean, Georgia's voting system implementation manager said just earlier this week, there are always a few instances of fraud and they're prosecuted, but it's minimal. Daniel, do you have any idea of how many fraud cases are prosecuted each election cycle? But even with those questions, Parisians are looking forward, focusing on rebuilding this beloved pillar of their history and culture. And as schools reopen, Newsy has learned many are still waiting on billions of dollars promised to them to pay for things like PPE, nurses, and technology. So where is that money? Dr. Mati Slachueo Davis is an infectious disease physician at Washington University School of Medicine and the John Cochran VA Medical Center. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us. How long could a pause on this trial last and what impact could it have on an already skeptical American public? Well, I think the lesson to be learned from what happened with AstraZeneca is that we've got to stop talking about time. We have to follow the science here. We have been saying in the research, medical, and public health arenas for weeks now that this should not be dictated by time. This should not be a politicized issue. This should be an issue where the science is around to, allowed to play out and for things like this to, to be allowed to happen in real time. So my answer to that is that what needs to happen now is for the researchers and the medical experts that are working in this field to really take a look at what's happening here. Is it reproducible? Is it really a signal towards the vaccine or something else? And I know you mentioned we, we shouldn't focus on time. The president has suggested we could have a vaccine by election day. Dr. Fauci has said that's unlikely. Help us understand, would there even be enough data on the vaccine candidates to make a decision by early November? Right, again, this is where I follow the people that have done this work, dedicated their lives to it, done this work for decades. The FDA, the CDC, and the advisory boards that have been put in place to make sure that there's checks and balances. So far, the leaders in those arenas have said unlikely. Now, we know that we have gotten better and better at this over time. We've learned from the past. We have protocols in place that we can follow. And it's feasible that we could have a, an earlier product. But again, the people that are working on this in the science arena are not going to push a product before they are confident that it is both safe and effective for the public. Now, the FDA has faced criticism for emergency use authorizations for hydroxychloroquine and convalescent plasma. It revoked the emergency authorization for hydroxychloroquine. So if the FDA approves a vaccine, can we trust it at this point? That is such a fair question. And, you know, if, 
if I was out there right now, I, there's so much confusion because people are seeing things come and go. Things We get excited about certain products and then we sort of push back. But what I have to say to that is we're in the middle of an unprecedented pandemic. People in the healthcare arena are doing everything they can to respond to this in a way that can literally save lives. So in looking at therapeutic options, I don't think that's a fair side-by-side -side comparison to something like a vaccine. Earlier on in this course, we were just doing everything we could to understand how we could help patients. Now, those of us that are in rigorous academic institutions that understand the science, even early on felt like we needed more time to look at hydroxychloroquine. But I, I empathize with physicians and healthcare providers out in the field who were just trying to do the best they could for their patients. So just really quickly, because we're out of time, but bottom line, would you trust a vaccine and would you encourage people to take one that's approved? I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a daughter. If the leaders say that it is ready to go, the likes of Dr. Fauci, the FDA, the CDC, the advisory boards, without a doubt. Anyone else past that? No. Dr. Madi Slashweo Davis, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. My heart bleeded. The heart of France, the heart of the world burned. Eric wasn't alone in his shock and grief, seeing Notre Dame Cathedral, the center of Paris, burn. But he did have a unique perspective as he watched some of France's wealthiest families and corporations pledge about 1 billion euros to rebuild the cathedral. When I hear people giving 200 million do uh, euros for that, and they can't even give 10,000 for homeless people, I say that's awful. How can they do that? It's just for their personal celebrity. We can't take care of Notre Dame's frame without thinking of homeless people who die in front of its door. Yves Collant is an executive at La Fondation Abbé Pierre. The foundation is carrying on the legacy of beloved French priest Abbé Pierre by combating poverty. It has an annual budget of 45 million euros. The Notre Dame Cathedral has a special connection to Pierre. It hosted his funeral. Homeless people sat in the front row. On Tuesday, Cologne tweeted from the foundation's account. It's gotten a lot of attention here in Paris. The tweet thanks the corporations for their pledges to help rebuild Notre Dame, but it also calls on them to donate just 1% of those pledges to the underprivileged. When we present a project to big companies and we ask for 10,000 euros, 20,000 euros, 50,000 euros to change the lives of people in great exclusion, or often to save their lives, and we hear that it costs too much, it's hard to hear after that that a company can raise hundreds of millions to save a roof. More than 67 million people live here in France. 150,000 of them are homeless. Total of 4 million are housing insecure, according to La Fondation Abbé Pierre. For perspective, France has a higher homeless rate than the U.S. When you are homeless in Paris, it is very hard to live because life is expensive. I was homeless for three years. I was depending on food distributions to eat, on vouchers. Mikhail Martin now has a roof over his head after someone heard him on the radio and offered him a spare room. Eric has been homeless for eight years. He lives in a shelter during the week. On the weekends, he stays at an office where he works. They're, they have social workers. They're supposed to work with you. After four months, they just quit to go to another uh, work, a working place. Then you have to wait four months to get another one, and then you have to start your story again and rebuild everything. Moreover, the atmosphere in these shelters is often awful. People can steal us, attack us, kill us. So we never know if we, tomorrow we'll still be living. We don't know that. Both Eric and Mikhail credit the French people's solidarity, their willingness to give a hand, for their survival on the streets. They say they've received the most help from the people who live in the neighborhoods where they stay. A lot of people don't even have money to buy a piece of meat or give food to their kids. 
That is why seeing all this money going to the rebuilding of a church, just for a church, is a little bit disappointing for us. Another reason for their skepticism? Tax breaks. Under current law, individual donors would see a 66% break, while corporations would get 60%. And France's former culture minister suggested donations for Notre Dame be eligible for a 90% break, but he walked that back. These tax breaks mean the French government will lose out on hundreds of millions of euros in tax revenue. But the Pinot family, which has pledged 100 million euros, says it won't seek one. Don't look at a catastrophe on TV for one monument just look at the catastrophe that happens every day on the street. We are a catastrophe because life made us like that. I didn't want to become a homeless person with a house, a small apartment. We can be secure. That's what we need, security, and a way to be independent. Lauren Stevenson, Newsy, Paris.